So last time we were talking about using group theory to understand chemical bonding, and we're going to continue that uh, today. We will see if we get through the rest of it. Okay, so we talked about how to set up matrices for some of the operations. I'm just putting this up here. This is what we did last time. So we talked about looking at these things where we can swap places between elements in the basis and we can set up matrices this way. And we also talked about a heuristic where we can, without writing the character, with, or without writing down the whole matrix, we can get the character of the matrix by just looking at how many of these elements either stay the same, exchange places, or change sign. And some people were asking me after class, how do you know when that works and that doesn't? And the answer is, it works in the case where every operation that you do in that, uh, in that basis results in one of those things happening. So in other words, the elements either change places, stay the same, or swap, or change sign. So for example, in this basis, we're talking about these three vectors. And so if we do a C3 rotation, then one of them maps onto the other one in every case when we do that. But now imagine that our basis was unit vectors in the x, y, and z direction. So now, so now my basis is the x, y, and z unit vectors. And if I rotate 120 degrees, they don't map exactly onto each other, right? So in that case, we have to write down the full matrix and we can't use that shortcut to get the character. So that's how you tell when you're able to do that and when you're not. Okay, so in this, in this case, we can do that. So let's talk about uh, a C2 rotation. And uh, you know, we have to be careful about how we set it up. So in this case, it's, we set it up such that A2 and A3 change places. Of course, there are a couple of other uh, C2 operations we could do as well. But so here's the uh, matrix operation for that, and its character equals 1, which again, we can get using the shortcut. So we see that A1 stays the same, so it, gets a, it contributes 1 to the character, and then A2 and A3 swap places, so each of them contribute 0. How about sigma h? This is a reflection through the horizontal plane, which in this case is the plane of the screen. And here we're not talking about anything that can change sign when you do that. We just have these little vectors pointing out. And so the matrix we get for that is the same as the identity, and its character equals 3. Does anybody have any questions about how we got here before we go on? So remember, what we're doing is we're setting up a reducible representation that is going to tell us something about bonding in this molecule, and then we're going to reduce it and hopefully come up with an answer that is intuitive. OK, so let's move on. So I've been setting up the characters for all of these operations. And so, so far, we have this uh, this reducible representation, which I named gamma B for bonding. And I put in the characters for each of these operations that we found so far. So we still have a couple of them left. So improper rotation, remember that's when, for S3, it means we rotate it 120 degrees and then reflect it through a plane perpendicular to the, per, to the principal axis. And so we can visualize that by looking at how our little vectors map onto each other and then set up the corresponding matrix that gives us that. And so the character of that is 0. And then the last one, 3 sigma v. So those are, of course, the, the vertical planes that, that cut through each one of these vectors. And when we do that, we get A3 and A2 swapping. And so the character of that is 1. Question? Yeah, on the previous slide, how, 
How did you visualize the horizontal plane to be the same as the identity plane? Well, so the, the horizontal, I, so I didn't say the horizontal plane is the same as the identity. I said that the matrix you get ends up being the same because we're reflecting it. So the molecule is flat, right? So we're reflecting it in the plane that's horizontal, so perpendicular to the principal axis. And remember, that it depends on the basis. So our basis is these vectors pointing outward. And so if you reflect that in a horizontal plane, it doesn't change anything, right? There's nothing that can change sign. And so you just get, you get the same thing as the identity because nothing changed. Yes? Uh, are you going to give us the A's on the left and the right side, and then we just have to figure out the matrix? Because like for the S, because that, that's how we've been figuring out the, uh, the 0, 1 <coughs> matrix. Right. But uh, for like the S3, I, I don't know how like that equals A3, A1, A2. Are we going to have to figure out how to visualize that? You are. And uh, for the improper rotations, it's hard. So remember, you rotate it by 360 degrees over n and then reflect it in that horizontal plane. So in this case, you just do the rotation, and then the reflection doesn't do anything, as we already discovered. So, so it's the same as a rotation in this case. And that means you might just need some more practice visualizing these things. But it's, it's a good question. You are definitely going to have to go through this entire process yourself once you get through some more practice. I'm going to give you examples where I tell you, OK, we're looking at this particular set of bonds. Now you set up your basis and, and make all of these representations. But you know, I'll walk you through it. We're going to do some examples in class so that you see how to go through it. Yes? Mm -hmm. On the S3, I went clockwise. I did, didn't I? Um, we should do it counterclockwise, and I will change this before I post the slides. And the moral of the story is, you know, try to always be consistent with what, with what you're doing and write down what you're doing. Yes? So for the improper rotation, uh, it's rotated 120 degrees, and then is it reflected in a horizontal plane? Yep. So I, I remember looking at a staggered ethane, and uh, it's reflected through like a vertical plane. Well, it's reflected through a plane that's perpendicular to however you rotated it, which may or may not be the principal axis. In this case, it happens to be, but it doesn't have to be. So, it's, so the, S, the S3 axis means that you rotate it about that axis and then reflect. So whatever the axis is, it's you reflect perpendicular to how you rotate it. It may or may not be the same as the principal axis. Yes? On the previous slide, Sigma H. Sigma H is the plane that's uh, like going across the screen. The, well, the molecule is flat, and the way I drew it, it's in the plane of the screen, right? The principal axis is pointed out at you. So, no, that horizontal plane is in the plane of the screen the way it's drawn here. OK, so here's our reducible representation. And I'm going to give some, some practice problems so that you can practice setting up these things. And in the meantime, we're going to go on and I'm going to show you how we reduce it and use it. But question first. Uh, I was just wondering, um, for the S3, did you, is A1 now in the direction of A4, or A3 is now? It's, well, so, so I rotated it the wrong way. I said we're going counterclockwise. So A3 should be. Actually, no, that's OK, isn't it? So A3 went to where A1 previously was, and then we reflect. So yeah, that's all right. OK, so that one is fine. All right, so here's our full reducible representation for bonding. Another question. Why did you say 2C3 was 0? Because when, when we do the C3 rotation, all of the little vectors swap places, right? And so they each contribute 0 to the character. You can also write down the full matrix and you see that you get 0 for the character. All right, so let's move on. OK, so I want to point out, here's how we would do this if we did have to deal with the basis being our, the x, y, and z axis. I'm doing this for completeness. If um, it's a little bit confusing right now, don't worry about it. We're going to go through it again later on. But 
the point is we have to use those rotation matrices and actually put in the sines and cosines of the angles in order to deal with the case where the elements that you're using do not exactly map onto each other. So if I drew this, this molecule you know, differently with respect to the axis system or if my basis were the unit vectors, I would have to set up my rotation <coughs> matrix in this way. We'll still get the same answer for the character, but we have to, to do it a little bit differently. We can't use the heuristic if we don't have an object that where everything maps onto another element of the basis when you do the operation. Okay, so again, that's just for completeness. If it, we're gonna go on, if it's not 100% clear right now, don't worry, we'll do more examples like that later. So now let's go back to our original problem. That was, we want to understand the bonding in this molecule in terms of symmetry. So we have a reducible representation that we made up by going through the characters of our basis, which is the bonds. And last time we learned the reduction formula that is going to tell us which irreducible representations add together to make this reducible representation. And so we're just gonna go through and use it, just like we did last time. So H is 12 in this point group. Remember, that's what you get when you just add up the total number of operations that are in this point group. And so we're just gonna go through. So our character, so for, for E, we have um, our um, character in the uh, reducible representation, the irreducible representation, and we just add these things up. And so I just went through really quick because we did this before. So, I, so in case it was too fast, I got three for E, I got zero for C3, one for C2, et cetera, just going through all of these uh, <coughs> operations one by one. And so for the number of A1 prime, we get one. Now we need to go through and do the same for the other irreducible representations in the group. Yes? When you actually break it down, um, how do you find chi, uh, chi sub i? The irreducible chi i, the irreducible representation? How do you find that number? That's on the character table. So, so when you look at the character table, the first irreducible representation is A1 prime, right? If you look at the character under E, say, it's one there, right? And so you just follow through the characters for each of the operations there on the table. Okay, so now we're gonna do the same thing for A2 prime. And again, I'm gonna go fast because we learned how to do this last time. It's just there so you can follow along and, and check your, your work. So same thing, we go through each operation and multiply the character in the reducible representation, which is what we made up just now, the character in the irreducible representation, which is from the point group table, and then the number of operations in the class. And we get that there are no A2 primes in this particular reducible representation. And now we have to do A1 double prime, which we do using the same procedure. And we don't have any of those. And then let's look at A2 double prime. Again, we get zero for that. So remember, if we get zero for some of these things, that's completely fine. If we get fractions, that means we did something bad. And we need to look at E prime. And if we go through the formula, we get one of those. And then last one, E double prime, we get zero. So we now have our reducible representation broken down in terms of which irreducible representations we can add up to get that. And believe it or not, that is gonna tell us something useful. So here we go. Our gamma B for bonding, sigma bonding to be specific, is A1 prime plus E prime. So now let's think about what this actually means. So we were talking about 
you know, what, what we wanted to learn in the first place is which orbitals in this molecule have the right symmetry to contribute to these sigma bonds. And think again to the answer that we all know from general chemistry, which is that that central atom is sp2 hybridized. And so look at what we got here. We got one symmetry species that is non-degenerate, A1 prime, so that tells us already that you know, maybe that's something like the s orbital. And then we got something that is doubly degenerate, E prime. So, so far that's consistent with what we know. But let's, let's go ahead and uh, look at this in a little bit more detail. So if we look at A1 prime, notice that that is the representation that's invariant to all transformations. That means it has a one under every operation in the character table. And I told you that every point group will have one of these and that the object that transforms in that way is a sphere. So that's like an S orbital. Yes? I'm sorry, what do the primes indicate? Like, how, like E prime and then E double prime? What's the difference? That's just its name. That's the name of that particular irreducible representation. You could name it Joe if you wanted, but it's, it's just, that's just what it's called. And they have different names in different point groups. Okay. If you asked a mathematician that question, you would get a very different answer. But. It's, uh, the, for, for solving chemistry problems, it's fine to consider those as that's, that's just the name of the representation. How do you have two different identities? Like, the identity of this one? Okay, don't get confused. The, the identity on the, the E on the top of the character table is the identity operator. Okay. The E's that are along the, the uh, left-hand side, those are symmetry species or irreducible representations that also happen to be called E something. It's, uh, okay. sorry, I didn't name them, but uh, it's, you, have, you just have to know by context. So where it's located in the table will tell you that. Okay, so A1 prime in this group is the thing that's invariant under all transformations. And so this, is, this one is important because you have to remember that. So for the other ones, you know, there's a little x, y, z, and so you can, you can determine really easily those are the p orbitals. For the s orbital, you have to remember that it's spherical and that that's the one that's, ide that's identical under all transformations. All right, so now E prime is our species that's doubly degenerate. So that means there are two orbitals. And if we look at the table, and look at what's listed there for E prime. It says X and Y. So that means that it's the PX and PY orbitals that are involved in the bonding. And again, let's go back to our general chemistry intuition. We know this because the Z orbital, we said, you know, the Z direction is defined as the principal axis, which is sticking out of the plane. And we're talking about the bonding that's going on in that plane, perpendicular to the Z axis. So we knew it had to be the PX and PY orbital. And it's comforting that we got the right answer by going through this whole reducible representation. So hopefully that gives a good understanding of the process and makes it more intuitive for later on when we do things where the answer is not going to be obvious before we start. Okay, so let's talk about some other things that, that uh, could happen. We also see that um, on our character table, under the E prime operator, or sorry, the, the uh, E prime symmetry species, we also have dx squared minus dy squared and dxy. And so by symmetry alone, it's equally probable that those orbitals are involved in the bonding. So how do we know it's not? Yeah, the answer is we know some chemistry, and so we know that there aren't any d orbitals that are available for bonding in boron. They're not filled. That would be a really high energy state, and it's unlikely. So symmetry alone tells us a lot, but it doesn't tell us everything. We still have to know some chemistry, and we still have to think about it. So why am I emphasizing this so much? Because I want you to go back and check your answer and make sure you got something that makes sense when we're doing these problems because it, it will be really important to making sure that you understand it for later when we do things that, uh, that are not as obvious. Okay, so SD2 would be a perfectly fine answer if we were looking at symmetry alone, but 
Instead, we have to know something about Kemri to rule that out. Okay, so what if we had another molecule that had the same symmetry, but it could make pi bonds? We could use the same argument to look at which orbitals might be involved in the pi bonds. So before we do that, is everybody happy with the sigma bond example and how we get to where we are? It's fine if you're not completely ready to make all these representations up yourself. I'll give you some practice examples that you can go through as homework. I'll try to get those posted maybe later today. Okay, let's talk about pi bonds. Okay, so now let's say we have NO3 minus. So that not only has the sigma bonds in the plane, but it's got some pi bonding perpendicular to it. We know it's perpendicular to it because we know some chemistry. Okay, so here's our pi bond. And I'm gonna go through this because it just, it, it again, it helps you build intuition for how to set up these problems. Okay, so let's talk about the symmetry of the pi bond. So we wanna set this up in a way that it's easy to visualize. So our pi bond is, you know, it has a node at the, the nuclei and we know that it's, it's got intensity above and below and it's, it, it's uh, positive on one side and negative on the other. And so we can represent its symmetry as just a little arrow pointing perpendicular to uh, the sigma bond. And so now our basis is going to be six vectors representing the possible orthogonal pi bonds. So why do we have six vectors? Because it's in a three-dimensional space, right? We could have the pi bonds perpendicular in one of two ways. You could imagine them sticking up out of the plane of the molecule, which of course we know is the right answer, or by symmetry arguments, we can also look at the pi bonds that are perpendicular to the sigma bonds, but in the plane. So here's what our basis looks like. Again, we're doing this not because we expect to be surprised by the answer, but as practice for how to set up these kind of problems. Okay, so we want to know by symmetry which orbitals can form our pi bonds. And so we're going to consider the in-plane and the out-of-plane set separately because it can't be both at once, right? So first we're going to look at the ones that are pointing up in this picture out of the plane. And we're going to do the same thing and go through our symmetry operations and set up matrices. So here's our identity operation. Unsurprisingly, that uh, gives us a character of three and it looks like it always does. And now we do a C3 rotation, which in this case, everything changes places and we did it in the correct direction, it's counterclockwise. And so we know that it's gonna have a character of zero because everything changed places. C2 Now we have to be careful because we're working with objects that can change sign and so we have to pay attention to that. So remember we, we represented the direction of this pi bond with this little arrow and so we have to pay attention to the fact that when we do a C2 rotation, not only do two of them switch places but you're turning it over so they change sign and we have to keep track of that. Okay, so if we add that up, its character is minus one. And again, we could get that using the shortcut. We can say two of them change places so they contribute zero, and the third one changes sign so it contributes minus one. Yes? Could you explain for C2? I'm just trying to visualize this. You're doing it 180 degrees. Wouldn't the 
other two blue points upwards now? Well, so I have my little arrows all pointing up, right? They're all in the same direction. Okay, so you just look at the arrows, not the actual. Well, so, so my basis is those orbitals that are going to make a pi bond. And so I represented that symmetry of the pi bond as just little arrows pointing in the same direction. Because if the orbitals were out of phase with each other, it couldn't make a pi bond, right? They have to be all in the same direction for that to work. And so what we're doing is we're starting with the symmetry of the object that we want to see, that being the pi bonds, and we're saying which orbitals can contribute to that symmetry. And so the other, the other thing that's important is remember that I said, okay, in principle we could have perpendicular ones in the plane, but we can't have both at once, right? Because something like this and something like that can't make a pi bond together. So we're considering one set at a time just to make our lives easier. I could set up a six by six matrix for all of them, but it would be harder than it needs to be, so we're not gonna do it that way. Okay, so we need to consider our signs. And again, if we do a sigma h reflection now, so again, that's perpendicular to the principal axis. If I do that, all three of them change sign. So again, we see that the matrix you get totally depends on the basis. It depends what you're applying the operation to. So the last time we had these sigma bond vectors that couldn't change sign when we did that because they didn't really have a, a sign, now we're dealing with something that's directional. And so we're gonna get minus ones instead of ones on the diagonal there. So its character is minus three. Okay, so we're almost there to setting up our reducible representation for the um, out of plane orbitals. Again, we have to deal with S3. So let's check, did I actually do it counterclockwise? And I did, so we're in good shape. But again, when we do that rotation, a couple of them swap places, or they, they all swap places, sorry. And then when we do the reflection perpendicular to that, they all change sign. And again, that is the, the, the improper rotation is the hardest one to visualize, so it, it's gonna take practice. Okay, so now we're left with just the sigma v. So same thing as before, two of them change places. But because we're doing a reflection and not turning it over, now nothing changes sign. And so that gives us a character of one. So, Here's our complete reducible representation for pi bonds in the out of plane set. So our next step is to reduce it. And again, we're gonna use the reduction formula that we learned and I'm gonna go through it quickly. Yeah, actually it looks like uh, I opted to not go through it. So that is left as, a, as an exercise to the student. But again, use the, uh, the formula. I had the slide in here, but it looked, I, I think I decided it was gonna take forever. Okay, so what we get for gamma, I called it OP for out of plane. We get A2 double prime and E double prime. And I encourage you to you know, go through and do this and confirm that you get that and make sure that you understand how to use the reduction formula. And now let's consider the in-plane set. So these are the blue ones. So these are the ones that are perpendicular to the sigma bond, but they're in the plane of the molecule. And we're gonna go through quickly. So here our C3 rotation doesn't change the sign of anything. It just makes stuff switch places. So its character is zero again. C2, again, we have to flip it over so stuff changes sign. Sigma H, what do you think? Anything change sign or no? No, right, because now everything is in the same plane as we're gonna reflect it. And so that gives us a character of three. Question? Yes? Uh, I still don't understand how the C2 gives you negatives. 
So are, are we rotating it for like around 180 degrees? So how is that uh, there? Like a, so. Let's see. Well, so you have to flip it over, and so the arrows that were pointing this way are now pointing that way. The principal axis is the the principal axis is the z-axis that you're that's sticking out at you. Well, so you have to uh, you have to rotate it about the c2 axis, which is perpendicular to that. Yeah. Okay, got it. So even though these these orbitals are now in, in in that plane, when you do the C2 rotation, you're still flipping it over. So the ones that were this way are now this way. The C2 is not the principal axis. That's right. The C3 is the principal axis. The highest order axis is always the principal axis. Okay. So let's uh, let's try to finish up this example so you can at least uh, see what the answer is to for practice purposes. Okay, so again, we do S3, so we rotate it 120 degrees counterclockwise and then reflect it in that horizontal plane, which doesn't change the sign of everything. <coughs> so that just gives us a position swap. And our vertical planes are going to change the sign because stuff is in the plane that we're, that we're reflecting about. And so we get minus one for our vertical planes. And so again, we need to use the reduction formula and reduce it. And I'm not going to do it because I think uh, I correctly calculated that we would run out of time if we, if we did all that in class. And so what we find is that we get, uh, for the in-plane orbitals, A2 prime plus E prime. So homework number one for next class is to actually do those. So go through, reduce it yourself, verify that this is what you get, and then prove to yourself that the orbitals that are involved are the ones that you expect to see involved in that pi bond set. Okay, so I think where we are now is we're finished up with what we're going to do with group theory for the moment. We're going to see it later in the quarter because it's going to come up when we talk about vibrational spectroscopy. Actually, it'll come up when we talk about selection rules. Okay, everybody chill out for a second. We still have a few minutes left. It's uh, distracting when everyone is, is uh, packing up and, and rustling around. Um, Okay, so we're going to see group theory again when we talk about selection rules. We're going to talk about how you know that integrals go to zero in a particular place. So one way to prepare for that, if you don't remember it, is uh, you know look up the Wikipedia page on the even odd rule. That's a that's one case of this. Um, that's something that uh, is very useful in terms of being able to look at integrals and just say that they go to zero trivially. That's it's something that is very helpful to be able to do. Um, next time we're going to start talking about rotational spectroscopy, so we'll be moved on to the next chapter. Um, all right, I will see you either at uh, office hours or next class.